every patient on earth, when they say, you have a lung nodule, right away, oh my God, I have cancer. Oh my God, I don't, I, I, I don't have a will yet. Oh my God, I, don't, I, I gotta film videos for my children. Like, it's human nature to go to the worst place on earth in your brain. And what I wanna do is drag you out of that and get you where you belong, which is, it's not cancer, or God forbid it is cancer, be able to tell you, whoa, 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 slow your roll, it's early stage, we're gonna get you cured of this, or, or look, it is bad, and I'm sorry it's bad, let me take you through this journey, let's, let's take you away from the what could it be to here's what it is, so that we can get you a plan of attack. And that ought to happen right away. If you had an abnormality, there were historically two ways to sample the lung. One involved putting a needle through your chest, through the lung, into the middle of it. And it had a fairly high complication rate, um, popping the lung, and it didn't stage you. You might have proved it was a cancer, but it doesn't tell me anything about your lymph nodes. The other way, of course, was surgery. That's very definitive. We go and cut the darn thing out. But what if it wasn't cancer? So you just had a big surgery, part of your lung removed, for what? from not cancer. Now again, nobody's ever upset when you tell them it's not cancer. But when you could say to someone, I could have told you it's not cancer in an hour long outpatient procedure with no cutting and no hospital stay versus what you had to have with the surgery. You know, my way is definitely better. I would argue strongly that, that there's not a reason to proceed first with a needle biopsy with some rare exceptions. If there is no one who does bronchoscopy in your region, and traveling is a challenge, and by the scans that have been done, it looks like there's a very low chance that there's any spread of tumor, then a needle biopsy is a reasonable procedure. But you understand you're taking on a higher risk with that procedure. Um, the thing that drives me the most nuts is not just the lung nodule. So you have a person with the lung nodule but also has enlarged lymph nodes. Now those lymph nodes may not contain cancer, but if you have this and it turns out to be cancer and your lymph nodes are enlarged, there's a decent chance, unfortunately, that that cancer has spread to your lymph nodes, right? And so someone will do a needle biopsy on this patient. Well, that's dumb for so many reasons. One, you proved the cancer that we were all kind of suspicious of anyway, but you didn't stage the person. I don't know what stage you are. I don't know if you're going to the operating room first, or you're getting chemotherapy first and then getting an operation, or whether you're never getting an operation because you're more advanced stage. Number two is they might not have gotten enough tissue to do what's called the molecular marker. So the biggest advancement in thoracic oncology has been the way better targeted therapies and immunotherapies that we can use to help people with advanced lung cancer. What you should have done Instead of, you have a lung nodule and lymph nodes, I'm gonna go in with my scope of that ultrasound, sample your lymph node, prove unfortunately that it's cancer, but prove what stage you are, and get enough material to run all those tests that are needed. And so with one procedure, you can be told, uh, it's stage 3A, 3B, whatever. You have molecular markers X, Y, and Z. You can get immunotherapy so that when you go to see the medical oncologist, because you don't need a surgeon yet, you have more advanced disease. And they say, we're gonna start you on these therapies. You're gonna get this drug and that drug because the analysis from the tumor that Dr. Hogarth removed through this ultrasound procedure that takes 30 minutes and you go home afterwards. So what ends up happening now, and it drives me nuts, someone gets a needle biopsy and they send them to see my surgeon, but they've, they've got lymph nodes. And my surgeon says, well, I don't know what stage you are. So then they have to come see me and then I go prove what stage they are and then they go get their therapies. And so time, you know, no matter how quickly I get you in, time's wasting, right? You just got told you have cancer and now you, you know, wait a couple of days to see the surgeon and get in to see me and then get the procedure you need. I mean, you should have had an abnormal CAT scan, been seen and scoped and staged and diagnosed and had all the diagnostic material done right up front, shaving off weeks of just wasted time and shaving off, why did you have to have two procedures? That's just dumb when one procedure would have solved everything. Every procedure carries a risk, right? When I do a lung biopsy, lung is a balloon. You poke in a balloon, you can pop the balloon, right? We don't want it to happen, but it can happen. Now with a bronchoscope, it happens about two to 3% of the time. 
With a needle, it's something like 20% where they stab through you. Yeah. So, you know, hence, I'm very biased, but bronchoscopy is a better approach. Lower rate of complications. Um, I wish the complication rate was zero, but it's not. And look, bronchoscopy may be safe. It may have a low complication rate, blah, blah, blah. It still has complications. You still have to have anesthesia. There's still a risk of bleeding and popping the lung. You know, it's not zero. So when you look at the risk that it's cancer and the risk of my procedure, ugh, but when the risk is cancer and this is the risk of my procedure, you need the procedure. After a bronchoscopy, you're in recovery for about an hour and a half to two hours. Um, if there's a complication, you might have to stay longer, you know, if the lung popped or whatever, but un very uncommon. This is an outpatient procedure. You'll have a sore throat for a day because of the tube from anesthesia. Today, you know, anesthesia, they feel groggy, weird. We tell people just, it's a good day to be on the couch and fall asleep to a movie. Tomorrow, normal day, you do whatever you want. Probably the biggest advance that's happened uh, there's been two big ones, I guess I would say, in bronchoscopy. One has been the advent of a scope that has an ultrasound on the end. So it allows us to sample the lymph nodes that are in the middle of the chest. Because look, if you have a lung nodule and someone says, oh gosh, that could be cancer. And, and let's say it is. Let, you know, we do some testing and it's cancer. Okay, that's unbelievably important. But probably the even more important question is what stage am I? Uh, because I need to know how we're going to treat this. Is this going to be surgery, radiation? Is it going to be chemo, etc.? What's my prognosis? And what they used to do was you had to have a surgery done to prove that you were non-operable. And if that sounds stupid, it is. Because you would have a surgery that would demonstrate that the tumor had spread and therefore surgery would not have helped you. So it's as dumb as it sounds. Operate to be told you shouldn't have an operation. So bronchoscopy, by going through your mouth and having a scope with an ultrasound that lets me see all of those lymph nodes, take samples of those lymph nodes, prove if it has spread or not spread, then pull the scope out, wake you up, you go home, there's no cutting involved, I can then tell you what stage you are or you know, if it's cancer, or maybe these lymph nodes are enlarged for other reasons, maybe it's an infection, you know, etc. The That's been the one big advance. The other big advance has been the whole field of navigational bronchoscopy, the ability to get to the outer parts of the lung, the first generation of equipment opened up a significant amount of the lung for us, and now we're in the era of robotics, and robotic endoscopy has changed things dramatically as to what we are capable of doing inside the lung. The field of bronchoscopy and advanced bronchoscopy and interventional pulmonary is a relatively newish field. So, um, they do, they, they're not just at universities, they're at high volume centers. So the first question would be, is to ask the person who is seeing you, how many navigational bronchoscopies they do a year? Whether that's with a robot, whether that's with an electromagnetic platform. There's just, you know, if they say, well, you know, I, I, I do a couple, then don't go to that person. There are people who specialize in this. We do this all the time, every day. And like I said, there, some of them are in community practices and some are at large institutions and large universities and everywhere in between. Um, that is your first sort of step. Second step is to ask them, what tools are you going to be using to diagnose my nodule? What, what advanced diagnostic equipment do they have? And then honestly, whatever they say, you can look that up and see what that is in regards to whether or not that is some of the more state-of-the-art equipment. So. Um, the robotic-based platforms or something called a Lumicyte, that's the newest superdimension-based platform, or whether they're using something called Archimedes from Bronchus or using Lung Vision, um, you know, so if they're using the Monarch or the Ion uh, for the robot side, you know, those are important. You want to know that they have an understanding of what they're doing. It's worth asking if they've done extra training in bronchoscopy. There are resources. You can go to the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy that's an organization that you can find online. It will obviously list people who are experts. So does the American Association of Bronchoscopy and Interventional Pulmonary. Um, you know, your person who's going to do your procedure, you know, bronchoscopy's evolved. 15, 20 years ago, no one was an expert. Everyone kind of did it. And you, and you know what happens when you get dabblers? Well, you want people that just do this. So like in our institution, there are three of us. We do this full time. This is what we do. We do bronchoscopy. As you can imagine, our outcomes 
and how we handle our nodules and how we bronch our patients, we have better outcomes than someone who does 10 a year, 20 a year. We're high volume. There's fantastic bronchoscopy centers all over the US of colleagues of mine. You know, we all know each other. This is a small world. Um, there are excellent people everywhere. Um, and that's what's great. And that's what the technologies I think have helped to more level the playing field so that as a patient, you have more selection. Um, you know, but ask, you're the one who's gonna have the procedure. It's not about whether you like the doctor and they happen to be local. If the best guy at it is an hour on the other side of town, this is your health. You, you know, you, you're not going daily. I didn't ask you to go drive an hour daily. You're going once and then you're gonna have a procedure. That's another time. And maybe a follow-up, a third time. Isn't your health and your life and your risk for complications worth a couple hours of driving? So again, someone's like, oh, we don't have anyone who does that procedure in our town. They're gonna to put a needle into me. Okay, well, the nearest place is an hour and a half away. Make the drive. Because that needle may prove you have cancer, but what stage are you? Now you're gonna to have to have another procedure for me to go prove what stage you are. But if I bronched you to begin with, I will prove it's a cancer and stage you at the same time. I just think, you know, the, the field of oncology right now is evolving rapidly in such a good way. And you know, if they've told you that there's no other options for your lung cancer, let's say you're advanced stage, you need to get to a major cancer center right away. Get to a large university that's a National Cancer Institute Center of Excellence because there may be a trial for different drugs. They had new mutations in these tumors. The thing is driving it. In other words, why your tumor is your tumor, not that person's. You know, when, when I look back, oncology 15 years ago, if it was lung cancer day at the infusion suite, there were you know, 100 people pretty much all getting the same cocktail. One size fits all, never fits anybody. Now on lung cancer day, I got 100 beds, you know, everyone getting, and not a single person is getting the same cocktail because we've gotten to that stage now where we can really individualize what's unique about your lung cancer versus that guy's lung cancer versus that woman's lung cancer and get you on the right therapies. And what's interesting is because even when we run out of those, more things keep coming and different drugs keep coming after different mutations. And in some cases, the other awesome thing that's happened because we have robotic scopes is if they say, we need fresh tissue, this study for whatever reason requires a fresh part of the tumor, which means another procedure. Look, if you've been through a couple of years of therapy for your tumor, you may not be as strong, as robust as you were, you know, four or five years ago. You need the least invasive procedure to go help you. Well, that's where the bronchoscopy comes in again. It's where we can go get fresh tissue and hopefully get you in a clinical trial, et cetera. That has, you know, broadened out what we can do when it comes to abnormal CAT scans, what we can do in regards to cancer diagnostics and staging, and what it's really done, especially robotics, has opened up the opportunity for cancer therapeutics to be administered through the scope. Now, all of that's still under investigation, so there's not a standard of care, so if someone talks to you about how a bronchoscope is going to cure your cancer, they better be telling you it's part of a clinical trial or they're lying, because right now, we don't have any ability to cure anything with a bronchoscope, but, as you can imagine, if I can now navigate out to the far reaches of the lung, if I'm able to put needles into the lung that can prove that it's a tumor, it's not a far you know, thought to say, why not a catheter that has, say, microwave capabilities? And I could quite literally ablate, you know, nuke it, fry it from the inside without cutting you at all. So diagnose and cure you without a single time in the hospital and without any cutting. You know, now, the studies have to prove it works, has to prove it's safe, et cetera. But what's been fascinating, what kind of robotics has opened up for us is to take some things that sounded very science fiction and if the studies back it up, becomes very science reality. But it's the bronchoscope and this navigational bronchoscopy and all the tools that we have that is what is opening up this whole field. This, this iteration of the technology that's letting us get to these parts of the lung is going to continue to open up all the different possibilities. So if someone says, I've got this great treatment that allow me to do blah, blah, blah. If only I could get it into the lung where it belongs, I can do that. <laughs> Bronchoscopy is evolving into not just cancer diagnostics and, and so forth and therapeutics, but also into benign disease. 
management of asthma, management of COPD, management of chronic bronchitis, management of emphysema to help people be, yes, the inhalers and all the stuff they got to do, but for people with more advanced disease, there's got to be ways to help these people breathe better. Many of them are still very limited. So for me as a bronchoscopist, it's fantastic to see all of the various options that are coming out both from just the technical aspect to, to do the procedure, but probably, you know, more, well, actually not probably, way more importantly, things that help people breathe better, things that help people get the diagnosis they need with least amount of invasiveness. I mean, this is where medicine should be going, right?